Hello everyone. This is Lakshmi from Pichandikulam. Just checking if everything's okay. Yes, ma'am. Everything's okay. Okay, great. So I'm going to mute from here just uh, just for now, and when it will start, I'll put the video and the mic on. Yeah. 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 Okay. Joss is here with me. Yeah. Thank. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, can we start, ma'am? Yes, yes, sir. yes, ma'am. Principal, ma'am, can we start? Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am, guys, start. Thank you, ma'am. Praise be you, Lord, with all your creatures. A warm morning to everyone present here. I, Dr. Mangai Kumaran, Assistant Professor of Education, Eco Club Coordinator. Sela Matitna College of Education, Ashoknagar, Chennai, is extremely elated to welcome you all for the international webinar on Remembering the Future, Future Garden, the story of Pichandikulam Forest. The earth is our home, our only home. Lord, grant us the wisdom to care for the earth and till it. May I now request Sister Shija Vayola, Assistant Professor of Education, to lead us through the prayer. Commit your way to the Lord in Him and He will act. Loving Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for this wonderful morning that you have given each one of us. Coordinator of all creation, you made a world full of beauty and infinite expression of your glory and love for all. Lord, we come to you this hour asking for your blessing, guidance, wisdom, and support. As we are going to begin this online international webinar on 
remembering the future garden, the story of Pichandikulam forest. Lord, make this webinar be a success run. Bless our resource person, our secretary sister, principal ma'am, staff members, and all the students of SMC. Lord, give us good health of mind and body to do your will. For all this we pray to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, sister. I now request Mrs. J. Rubina, Assistant Professor of Psychology, to deliver the welcome address. A quote by Victor Frank. When we are no longer able to change the situation, we are changed to change ourselves. The secret to change is to focus all of our energy not on fighting the old but on building the new the quote by victor frank on behalf of stella matituna college of education and eco club unit i take this opportunity to welcome mr joe brook the resource person of this international webinar on remembering the future gardens the story of pichandikulam forest please introduce mr joe brook Director, Pichandikulam Forest, Oroville. Joe grew up in the Australian state of Tasmania, a place full of wild natural beauty, and came to Oroville in 1970. After living in Europe and Africa, he joined the early pioneering efforts in land restoration at Oroville and founded the Pichandikulam community in the year 19. Victor is now a vibrant 60-acre forest with 800 species of plants in the grassland, a nursery and an ethno-medicinal forest. In 2002, he embarked on environmental education to the villages by setting up Nadukukam Environmental Education Center in a village near Oroville. He also founded Pichandikulam Forest Consultant Business Unit to provide environmental restoration services and is currently directing the restoration biodiversity at Adyar Punga in Chennai. We are grateful to have such an eminent personality in our midst. Welcome you sir. Next, I appreciate and acknowledge the support and guidance given by the Secretary, Reverend Sister Pauline Mary, and the Principal Ma'am, Dr. Mrs. Joseph Catherine. Welcome, Sister. Welcome, Ma'am. I take this opportunity to welcome the Organizing Secretary, Dr. Mrs. Mohi Kumaran, Assistant Professor of Education and Equal Club Coordinator, and Organizing Committee members, and all the faculty members for their constant support. I also welcome wholeheartedly the students of Stella Matituna College of Education, students and teachers from various institutions. Once again, I welcome you all. Thank you, Rubina, ma'am. Progress is possible only with a change. And those who can change their mind can change anything. It gives me immense pleasure to hand over the session to the resource person who has conquered the nature and has created an impact with a great difference in order to make our earth healthy and support human survival with sustainable future. May I now request Mr. Josh Brooks, founder, director of Pichandikulam Forest to take over the session. Sir, please. Hello everyone, can you hear me? This is Lakshmi from Pichandi Kulam. Yes, Lakshmi, we can hear you. 
Yeah, thanks Sudha. We're just having some internet connectivity issues at this point. Um, but we can hear you and we can see the screen with mobile data. So um, just give us two more minutes. Are, are we all here? Are we ready to start? Yes, ma'am. We can go ahead. Okay. We're just, just trying to see if um, our internet is uh, back. Sorry about this. We haven't had trouble and just this morning. Um, okay. I think we're back on. Just wait a second. Hello. Hello. Can you hear us? Yes, ma'am. It is audible. Okay, we can start now. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, who is presenting first? Ma'am, you can do. Um, I thought there was a welcome address first. All that is done, Lakshmi. It's all Lakshmi. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, Lakshmi, just a minute. I have a small request. Uh, this is Sudha from Pichandi Kulam. I request, uh, just since we have internet problem, I request only the presenters to have the video on so that uh, it will take less of internet space uh, for the present, you know, for presenting. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm going to share uh, our screen now. Your screen? Yes, Lakshmi, we can see your screen. Oh, great. Everybody, yeah, everyone, please. They can see you. They can see you in a little box and they can see this and have it. Good morning, everybody. Can people hear me? Yes, yes. Good morning. Good morning. So, my name is Joss, and I'm speaking from a, a forest, a 70 acre forest in the Green Belt of Oroville. We're very lucky. I'm sure we're luckier than most people, having lived through even the last six months in this forest, milking our cows, growing our seedlings, making our plants, loving our trees and animals, wildlife. And this morning, okay, I can't see all of you, obviously, and I understand there are a whole bunch of people out there. And I'm, I'm going to try to share some of the some of the things that have influenced me in my my life my sort of humble career as a, a green person and i if it gets if it gets boring then i mean i won't even know whether you 
go somewhere else or go and make a coffee, but um, perhaps some of it might be hard to understand, but I understand at the end we might have some time for a few questions too. I just go forward here. The picture, the picture here is of a plant that's it's called mimsalon. Mimsalon umbellatum in this scientific term. It would have covered a lot of the Coromandel coast a long time ago. Now there's there's not so much left. The mother the mother of Pondicherry, who I probably will refer to now and again in this little talk. She named this flower Miracle. I think that's what we're all hoping for and trusting in. Just him. Yeah. Sorry. So really. Okay. Sorry. Um, do you want to move? <laughs> I trust you can see these pictures. And I've been asked, and you expect me to talk about ecology and green things. And actually, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about football. Now this picture, these pictures are probably of one of the most polluted, darkest places on the planet in say the second half from about 1850 to 1900. It's a place called Manchester. And it was very rich in a way. Some people were very rich there. It was the center of industry for the world. It was using a lot of the resources of India, cotton, etc. But it was pretty, pretty black, pretty dark. It was the, the high point of the so-called Industrial Revolution. And, yeah, not exactly wonderful conditions for living. And this is, you can imagine, in, say, 1870. This, of course, is, yeah, what it's like living in Mumbai in some conditions. As humanity, we haven't made a lot of progress from there to this. but. That's another story. This is, this is part of the problem. Uh, the problem of maybe things like equity and inequality, etc. Right. Here's our football story. Now, 1878, some of you perhaps have heard of a little football club called Manchester United. And it was actually started in 1878 in Manchester by the people that made trains. They got together and they started a football club. The thing is, there it is. Look at their long shorts. And their, yeah, but they had fun playing. This is part of my story that a few years before 1878, an Indian doctor had taken his three boys by boat from Calcutta, well, from Calcutta to England and dropped these three boys off to live with a clergyman in Manchester, just round the corner from where a few years later the Manchester United Football Club was formed. The little boy sitting there actually became a, yeah, 
and and one of the most important people in the freedom struggle for India, in the development of of of, of a new India, it was Sri Aurobindo. That little boy grew up in Manchester for six years. He probably played football in the evening. But of course, later, after being the revolutionary in Bengal, escaped to Pondicherry, and around him grew up the Sri Aurobindo Ashram. Well, the Sri Aurobindo Ashram in Pondicherry, I hope that some of you know about that, perhaps you visited. Of course, it was, it gave birth to the ideas and later the physical being of the place where I sit now, Orville. The mother, the French Egyptian lady came and joined him and she physically put together the ashram and then this idea of doing, of creating an international township, people from all over the world. And that's what we are, these few thousand people living here just north of Pondicherry in our gardens, forests, workshops, etc. But I'm just trying to position where I am and what I, what I, what was the formation, what was some of the influences. So this, he grew, he spent those six years before he went to London and then to Cambridge and then came back to India. He was there in Manchester. I always think that probably he blessed that football club too. Now, 60 years later, it's just part of my story. I'm sharing this sort of personal thing. I was, I was actually born 60 years later, just around the corner from the Manchester Football Club and, uh, and where Sri Aurobindo lived at that time. And I was born in a sort of terrible time in that crazy experience that the world faced called World War II. So right at the end of World War II, and rockets were raining down on places, and particularly Manchester. That's when I was born. And when I was born, this is what Manchester looked like after a bombing raid, completely smashed. I think I'm just positioning my time as a, as a, it's, hi it's history. And of course, it makes me very old, doesn't it? You can work out. But that's okay. But these 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 memories are there. England after the war um, had its yeah. I thought a lot of people would have wanted to go somewhere else. We went to Australia. The family went to Australia, and uh, it was it was sort of. Australia was a bit fresher after the devastation of, of Europe. It's just to remember, India was nearly invaded, but Europe was devastated. And this is not so long ago. I say, in my lifetime. We went on a boat. Those days you went on a boat. It took six weeks to get to Australia. You went through the Suez Canal. Yeah, if you took an airplane, it took about five days to get from, say, Australia to, to Europe. Right. I, we went to Australia and went to live in a place called Tasmania. Now, several hundred years before, when India, of course, was very much, let's say, under the control of uh, the British, the East India Company, etc. The, the colonial powers were everywhere. People were traveling in ships like this. And these ships were coming from the Dutch colonies. The Dutch colonies were in Indonesia. And a man came called Abel Jansen Tasman. 
came down from Indonesia discovering parts of Australia. Now I use this word discover because at that time Europeans were only just starting to understand that this big continent to the south of of New Guinea, Malaysia was there. They were adventurers. They were mostly looking for things to trade. This drives most things, which in the end is sort of greed. It's what you can take and sell somewhere else for profit and probably, yeah, use the people. That's a map of Australia, as you can recognize. You see in the bottom right hand corner, right down the bottom, a little heart shaped island of Tasmania. These are journeys in, in the end of the 17th century, discovering parts of Australia. So I'm just reminding how new it is that people knew, knew anything about you know, that some of these parts of the world. And Australia was one of the last continents to be discovered. And I use that word discovered in sort of inverted commas. That's a map of Tasmania in about eight, made in 1830. This is the little island where I grew up later. It's a beautiful island, full of wilderness, very different plants, very different animals, because it is an island, just like Australia is an island, so it's unique. When the people went there, they found all sorts of animals, birds, and, and plants that were completely different from what they'd known mostly in Europe. Now this map is really interesting. You can see it's called Aboriginal Australia. And although I hope you're following a bit this, this, um, this story, I'm telling you of a bit of the influence of and the places where I grew up. Now, when the Europeans came to Australia, 1700s, 1800s, 1700s, they thought Australia was empty. Now, this is a very important map, and it's part of, it's part of a lot of stories of what we say is wilderness. Oh, nobody lives there. No one lives in the Amazon. No one lives in the jungles of perhaps even India. Actually, they do. Each of these colored patches were Aboriginal tribes. Different languages. Culture that went back 60,000 years. 60,000 years, the Aboriginals have the people had come from the north, coming across from the islands, and gradually populated Australia, and managed it. Obviously, a ecologically sustainable way for all those eons. The Europeans, they just said it was an empty land. This is actually, it's in the museum in Sydney. It says here, the Aboriginal people are saying, you're standing on land of the Gadigal people. What usually happens when people who are in fact invaders come, yeah, they kill or the diseases that they bring wipe out whole population. It happens continually. At the moment, probably, it's more like in Amazonia that that sort of thing is happening. These were the people. And those Aboriginal tribes, and their paintings on caves, whether in Tasmania, or mainland Australia, can be 60,000 years old. 
and it continues the same stories that are depicted there are told still in the Aboriginal mythology. The Aboriginal people are very alive and well. They're lawyers, doctors, parliamentarians, as well as trying to, to, to re-establish whole aspects of their culture in Australia. It's a whole other story. I don't want to do that, but the point, this is part of what I want to say. Here's a painting done of the Aboriginal people in about 1810 in Tasmania. The British, when they came, they could not believe how the landscape looked almost like a garden. And this is the story, one of the ecological points that I want to to share with you now and we'll come through the rest of what I want to say. This is a book written by an uh, academic, Bill Gamage, the biggest estate on earth, how the Aborigines made Australia by, by burning very cleverly, knowing the wind, knowing the rain, burning little bits so the grass would come up, so the kangaroos would have grass, the kangaroos would be there, then they could eat the kangaroos, could hunt the kangaroos. They landscaped Australia. Just like years later, when I've been in the Amazon rainforest, there it's been clear and it's been explained to me how the Amazon is planted. And so many areas of what we think, oh, this is wilderness. Actually, people lived there in harmony, knowing the seasons, knowing the berries, knowing the animals, whatever. So this story, in the, in the light of what you perhaps read sometimes, that Australia is on fire last year, all of Eastern Australia, incredible devastation. Because these practices, even limited controlled burning, are not done enough. I hope I'm not losing you. But you think about what's happening in California at the moment. What I'm trying to say is that land needs to be nurtured. It needs practices if we want to live sustainably, and particularly in this time of climate change. This story is being very much researched at the moment in Australia. Some of the Aboriginal practices of land management are seriously being considered. On the other hand, I just want to say that the story of Australia, this wonderful country full of extraordinary wildlife, and wildscapes and wilderness is actually the fastest, quickest environmental disaster on the planet in 200 years because of bringing hoofed animals, because of bad farming practices, because of pollution of rivers. It's bad. But, of course, the tourist brochures will always show how wonderful it is. It is so vast, so big, so, so varied that you can sort of get away with it. But the, the, the invaders, that means the people, the British, everybody who's come there, the seriously damaged ecosystems which the Aboriginals looked after for 60,000 years in a sustainable way. This is the landscape of what, when the colonial, the colonists came to, to Tasmania, they found. Trouble was there. People fought, people killed each other, people died from disease, and the last of the Tasmanian full-blooded Aborigines died in about 18, 1870. Sadness, the oldest people in the world. 
And this is where I grew up. These were the people. And yeah, it's, it's an interesting statement. Following the 1788 invasion of Sydney and the imposition of foreign law in Australia. Okay, this is not a new story. But it's something, as I said, the Aboriginal community is very, very alive and well. And I hope we'll have increasing influence on policies and the direction of Australia. The wisest people in Australia are old Aboriginal women. They're amazing. Treaty. They are, they are literally asking for a treaty because it was never done. Anyway, this is a little, a little aspect of green ethical politics. There they are, the Aboriginal flag outside of the Parliament House. Right, we'll switch. I hope there's some people still with me. Um, I have no idea. Okay. Okay. So I grew up in those times of the, say, the 50s. Australia was known as the lucky country. It hadn't gone through a war. It was vast. It had lots of natural resources. All those, all those mines and all those uh, food. Fantastic. And it's a, it's a sort of image of Australia. The Australian bloke, can, cigarette, whatever. At a country fair while I was growing up, and even now, one of the, one of the competitions is how to cut trees down the fastest. And you have to sort of climb a pole by making little notches and putting in planks and getting to the top and then cutting the top off the pole. This was the, the brawn, the tough Australian image. Let's cut down. Let's cut it down. If it stands, let's cut it down. It's a beautiful place, though. It's amazing. It's wild. It's often you walk in places where perhaps people haven't even ever before. The Aborigines were not so many. They walked lightly on the land. In Tasmania, it's extraordinary rainforest. Plants that that are so special and a part of we call it a world heritage area, which is the highest level of constant This is where I grew up. I studied and tried to study this and that and that. Didn't becoming a lawyer, so I left the university and my first job was as a lighthouse keeper on a little island off the bottom of Tasmania. It's where I lived. The beauty, yeah, it's all there. You never forget these images. This is south of Australia, south of Tasmania, so on the way to the Antarctic. I, it was a time in Australia, not very nice. White Australia policy, Vietnam War, the young people like myself had to go and fight with the Americans. I didn't like that idea, so I ran. I went and lived in Turkey, in tro troglodyte communities. I lived in Paris. In Paris, which was exciting, intellectually, etc. But it was at that time in the 60s of a lot of questioning. People the May Student and Workers Revolution as part of that, where we questioned a lot of things, which I hope that's what you're supposed to do when you're young, you're supposed to do it all the time, but you do it particularly when you're sort of getting into your 20s and say, well, what's this all about? 
And there you were in this sort of intellect, one of the intellectual capitals of the world in Paris. And suddenly, suddenly you're questioning what this consumer society, etc., was all about. So, yeah, that was 68, the French Revolution. We were part of it, workers and students. It was more than, I say, as a fun. It was so stimulating. It changed so much in so many people's brains. And soon after that, I left Europe. I went and lived in the Himalayas. I lived on the Ganges. I lived in, in old uh, villages in Kumon. And before coming south to this magic garden of South India, Tamil Nadu, and discovered there something I'd heard about from travelers who talked about this, this place that was being started in South India. And I came across Oracle and I came across the mother. So I came here in 69 to Pondicherry. The mother was there. She was still guiding, giving advice and having the year before in 68 created in the, the, the township portal. This is a picture from 68 where sold from 120 countries was brought, put in an urn. That urn is still there. And hundreds of people, thousands of people came. Indira Gandhi was very much involved and, and because it was, it was an invocation, UNESCO, the United Nations thought what a wonderful idea to build a city of harmony and peace and brotherhood and sisterhood and get people from all over the world to come without nationalism, without this, without, we just wanted to work for, for a, a, a universe city, a place of sort of unending education. That's the charter. You've probably seen it before and you can see it online. I don't want to, this isn't just about Oracle, but many of us here still find this, yeah, as far as you can go. It doesn't belong to anybody. We don't own anything here. It's unending education. It's some sort of a bridge between the past and the future. We'd like that. This is, but don't forget, this is 50 years on. This is 50 years ago and our idealism, etc., and the, the wonderful, um, say, imagination, the spiritual imagination of someone like the mother. Yeah, it was a good guide. But it's a place of research, material and spiritual. Right, well, when everybody went home from there, the inauguration ceremony, um, which people tend to do, it's called a function, a good function. And they, it was a good function, but there were probably bits of paper blowing across an empty landscape. But this is what Oriville looked like. And when I turned up a year later, this is what confronted us. It wasn't as if it was green rice fields or beautiful gardens. It all had to be sort of done. And that's great. That was the challenge. I think for most of us at that time, and we were young, we were healthy, we were, we were full of imagination and our law degrees or philosophy degrees or whatever we'd done didn't help us much. We had to learn how to build little, little houses to protect ourselves from rain or sandstorms. So this is, one of, this is uh, one of the first houses I built for myself. I think that's me in the top window, yeah. That's me building a house. So I say it's, it, it was a time of, of, uh, of, of having fun also. And this is what the, and playing. The mother was very insistent on that. Please look, here's a place, now play. Play seriously, but play. Experiment all the time. This is the landscapes we, 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 we had. 
time eroded eroded laterite um, not much there and we were we were also quietly beginning to build that structure that was invoked right from the beginning called the Matraman which is just it's a meditation place it's a place of where you you get charged where your batteries get charged and of course some of you might have seen it some might even have been inside it but this is a picture from probably 71 where we used to go up in the early morning and chattis and mumpties and dig the foundation later of course it's it got a frame and then got a covering and this is what two years ago this is this is in the 50th anniversary so there's the urn there's the urn with the soil of soil but with the soil from 120 countries this is the amphitheater and on the 50th anniversary water was brought from i think 350 locations and mixed together in the urn in the middle in the bowl in the middle and then distributed back out again into the world so soil and water but 50 years ago this is our environment this is the local village cut to and pretty yeah basic and these were our teachers of course these are people perhaps they couldn't read and write but they could tell stories for hours on end and we were there just growing up our ragi and our learning how to tie knots and build houses to an old picture that is what you call pioneers and there's nothing like it you perhaps who are listening to this you young vibrant incredible india um yeah find a piece of land homestead pioneer it's amazing you become quite healthy but these are the places we built in the early 70s this is the first hut in Pichandikola. in Pichandikola, i came here in 73 I'd been in Oroville a few years, watching the sun come up and go down and the wind blow and, and making lots of friends with the, the local people. And I started this place at Pichandikolan with a group of young boys from the local village and with our bullet carts and, and mixing it with yeah geodesic technology geodesic architecture and this it was always a mixture or it always is the past the future and the black cat yeah this is homesteading the beginning of 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 this community of pichandikon which is now 70 acres and that's a picture taken in 73. Uh, the guy on the left, he's a traditional healer. He was a poet, playwright, and taught me about yeah, the uses of plants. And, you know, not just pretty, they're not just botanical specimens. They're actually, they're part of a whole culture. Yeah. And that there's 400 plants in this area that are still used yeah. for, for medicine. That's me on the right. This is the landscape. So at the same time, okay. here we are positioned. Just right at the bottom is Pondicherry. It comes to Oroville, a circle of Oroville. And that triangle between the Oroville, Pondicherry, Maracanum, and Chindivana it's 800 square kilometers this around this Calavelli tank and that's what we started to begin to understand this is where we were and that's something that the the green people that were planting trees I think 
really got to know where they were. So they went out on bicycles, on foot, on bullock carts, on motorcycles, into these little remnant forests and discovering that every one of those blue patches in this map is people made. They're not natural. This is a constructed landscape. Do you remember the picture of the pictures of the Australia? A landscape formed over 60,000 years. This is formed definitely over several thousand. Storm management. I'm sure that played part of it. Huge storms that some of you have experienced, like a few years ago in Chennai. Why hadn't those storms been coming and going over millenniums? Of course. And some smart Raja, Zamandar, powerful guy, British headman, just said, hey, I don't think it's a good idea to be washed away. Let's, let's do something about controlling this water flow. And also, it will allow us to have perhaps another crop of rice. Or become, yeah, become a big, bigger community to be able to make the wonderful temples of this area. So this is a constructed landscape, and this we began to understand. In this map, see how little forest area is left. 0.001% perhaps is left of the Coromandel Co forest. Right at the top, you've got the, the hills, the Gingies, the beginnings of little bits of the Eastern Ghats, water coming down through ponds. But by the time it gets down the bottom, this is in Oregon, that's almost millions of tons of soil that's been washed out into the sea. And farming that was often almost more like hydroponics not a lot of vegetation to hold the water. When the water, the monsoons did come, this is how it flowed. This is a picture of the canyons of Oroville. That's a lot of water going out into the sea. The sea would be red for 20 kilometers up the coast. It's like the blood of Oroville. We said to ourselves, well, this is crazy. How can we create a township here? This wonderful dream of the mother and the dream of all the people that, that, that had worked so hard in the decades before Oroville started. How could, how could we think of doing this if the very foundations were being washed away? So let's stabilize. Let's try and, try and stop this this, this flow of this melting of the landscape and then the blowing of the landscape in the dry months when, when sandstorms, dust storms, were just blow for weeks on end. This didn't make sense. So that was the real stimulus for the thousands of kilometers of buns of, what do you call them, little check downs, um, and the planting of trees. And that started from the beginning. Because the mother, she, she loved plants. She gave us so many, yeah, so many, so many ideas and, and, and guidance, so much guidance about how to work with nature. She would say, look, you need compost, you need, you need the seedling. Don't forget the spirits of the forest. They're still there. They're hiding in the sacred groves, in the canyons. You work with them. I think from the beginning, we understood this importance of water. And of course, we began to know that incredible culture of those constructed landscapes is complex from the Arus and the Yeris to the Kanmais, right down to the Kualams, the Kutta, the Uranis. 
But this is, this is, it's your heritage. It's the heritage of the, the extraordinary Dravidian Tamil people. Wow. That's Chimbrambakam. Right. Back in the times of colonial India several hundred years ago, but that had been constructed too. You know Chimbrambakam. What happens when Chimbrambakam is not managed properly? You remember the floods? What, five years ago? Before the population out of control, blah, blah, before the pollution from all the industries, it was really nice to take a boat on the coom. This is just, this is part of my story because I, we work quite a lot in Chennai. But you can bring it back. This is in our lifetime almost. Right? We can swim in the coom again. Take a vow, all of you, that we can swim again in your lifetime in the Adia and the Kool. Why not? Why not? But what's happened? These are pictures that I've taken myself over the years. When water tables were higher, when you could have open, when you could have these water lift systems with bullets, you could have the kawales, the yetoms, yeah? There's extraordinary where, systems where you, you lift water just, just a meter out of the pond into the rice fields. And you can't do this without singing. And it's pretty difficult to sing for a big motor. Of course, it's just touching on the genius of India too. Wherever. You, some of you, I'm sure, have been to Rajasthan or Gujarat. I think Gujarat. Yeah. And I took these pictures because we, we worked a lot in the 80s recording the traditional systems of, of Rajasthan and Gujarat. Genius. At the beginning of Pichandigon, we needed water. Our water table is 150 feet. We drill down by hand, round and round, corkscrew, lift up and put up windmills, then made of wood and canvas, we call Cretan windmills, to lift the water up so that we could water our electricity and then later water the new sea. Yeah, at that time, still but rare, of course, bullocks and even more bullocks we use. And these, these were our teachers learning how to plow. We had to learn how to plow. Otherwise, the guy over the fence would laugh at you on the next field. We learned about the Samai, about the Tenai, about the Ragi and Kombu and the Varagu. We grew it, ate it. And we still do. We watched the, the oil mills making the sesame, peanut. Even, even neem oil. And particularly more and more, we understood this, this incredible rare vegetation, which was hiding. Where was it hiding? In the sacred groves, in these temple forests. We, we, we mapped these groves from north of Chennai down to the bottom of India. Hundreds of them, finding the mother trees, going back, getting the seed, going back to Oracle, learning how to, how to germinate them. Learning how to germinate them and then starting to, to, uh, to grow our forest. These forest groves are still there, getting more and more devastated by encroachment. And this is one of the works to protect them, protect, conserve, and expand. 
they're very popular, but that's the problem. Thousands of people going there on a Friday, on a Monday, cooking their rice, their chickens. Beautiful. This, this horse is made of pottery. I mean, it's cooked in sit. We got to know the environment. We got to know the, where we were, the wetland. The wetland, he's been out all night, he's prawns. When the grass, when the wetland dries up, then they cut the, the sombu, put it on the roofs. The symbiosis of, of nature and habitat. We saw the, the, the culture that we were, we were in, it's one of my favorite pictures. This is in the middle of Chennai, you probably know it. It's in Flower Bazaar. But to allow the tree to be there and just to build around it, something wouldn't happen in Australia. As we got to know our, our story, we sang it more and more. This was the thing called the Green Walk. We went for a week, we put it with our bullet cart into the villages around Oroville, we put a solar panel on the on and could play little videos to the kids in the evening. It was fun, singing songs, planting trees. In the 80s, I was in, in working with the Rajasthan girls ever sung, documenting water systems and tree planting systems in the Tar Desert. This was called the Punch. But activism, just gentle activism, is so important. Please, please, please do it. I started to grow. Yeah? And all those things that, that come when you do plant trees. You don't plant trees. You plant butterflies. You plant birds. You plant in the end civet cats and rusty spotted cats. And all sorts of wonderful things. And you're discovering the old, the old, old trees of the area that hundreds, sometimes three, four, five hundred years old, the size of this terminally Arjuna tree. And this is sort of reverence. And I'm also, luckily, with people in other parts of the planet who live in reverence of the environment they're in. When you've walked in the Amazon rainforest, you just don't question a lot of things. You don't ask a lot of questions again. It's so incredible. The beauty of a place where in one square kilometer of this forest where I was walking when I took this picture has more biodiversity, more biodiversity in the whole of North America. 120 different sorts of snakes. And the beauty is overwhelming. The beauty of the people and the sadness of the people. I'm sharing this because the story goes out. If you you do this and you, you have a lot of sisters and brothers everywhere trying to protect and plant the same thing. This is another story. The mark on this stone is 12,000 years old, oh, this, 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 this glyph. Um, people who were perhaps the first people, and they're wonderful, they're wonderful to be with, they're full of wisdom, and they're right on the edge, like people are. Yeah, these are the sand people, the Bushmen of South Africa. I spent time. So in our own context, where we come from, we have a young archaeologist working with us. These are the archaeological sites because we feel it's important to get through to the school children, to everyone where they are, the sense of place. 2,500 years ago, which is not far, it's not long. It's nothing like the 60,000 of the Aborigines in Australia. But these stories are known, we've recorded them, and we honour them. And in Oroville we have an archaeological museum. But to get through to people where we come from helps us to know where we're going. And there, yeah, a thousand years ago, when poets came together, yeah, and sang songs, and then they're chipped to the temples. This helps us to know the vegetation, the animals, the culture of that time. This is the high point. I ask you whether you think we're in the high point 
of Dravidian civilization. We transcribed them. This is in the French Institute. Palm leaf manuscripts onto computers. And in the end, it comes back to collecting seeds. Collecting seeds. <coughs> this picture taken 30 years ago in Pichantico. This was our life for all these decades, collecting seeds, growing seedlings, and then teaching and with the traditional healers yeah, to the young people. This has been our story. And to, to the point where this picture, this is recent. This is where part of our team has worked with the women, to the point where they now collect the, collect the plants, make the medicine, and sell the medicine even as far as Delhi. Their own self-sufficient um, little group, little business. Enterprise, sustainable enterprise development. So this is Pichandikola. Now, it's got 800 species of plants. It's got, we use art a lot. We sculptures and granite, paintings. And of course, it's all the other things that you get when you plant a forest. The birds. Yeah, the morning light, the sound, the silence. You plant silence, you plant beetles. And you plant, yeah, also the, the hay and raptors. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all come back. The point of this, the rusty spotted cat we recorded on a night camera trap. It had not been seen for 187 years in this area. As we knew, learned our song, we, we went out into the villages. We adopted a bit of school, a very rundown school, known as the worst school in Tamil Nadu, 10% pass rate, no water, no toilets, four and a half teachers. This is about 13 years ago. And that's, we built a little environment center. We like building environment centers. We like having a place where you can have conversation. Then the kids collected the seeds. They planted lots of, lots of plants and, and, uh, and had all sorts of interesting training, whether this would be strictly allowed in schools, but uh, uh, fauna sensitization. So many snakes are quite friendly anyway. This sort of material that we do. One of our team drew this by pen. This is a set of many posters of the whole ecosystem. It's another training space we've created out there in, in a young forest of 30 acres, which I hope some of you might come and visit sometime. But this is all created. This is what we call water retention landscapes. We love making ponds. Just like perhaps the ancients made big ones, the Zamandars and the Maharajas. And, um, we like making small ones. So the water stays higher in the water. And then we can pump it out again with our windmill that we design and make in our Lenderson plant awareness clubs, kitchen garden classes. This is, and yeah, we also like looking after the animals and making balls that you have a cattle camp, hold the tongue of the animal, push the ball down its throat, and blah, blah. This last little bit is I think about something in the middle of that city where a lot of you are, I presume. Uh, the great city of Madras or Chennai. And uh, we were asked by, yeah, the corporation, the government, basically, to help with transforming a really filthy, messy area in Adia. And it was a challenge of linking people with, with a restoration exercise. That was the plan we put together over a year. We showed it to Madam Jetalita and then to Mr. Karananadi and all sorts of people were involved. Lots and lots of people were involved. It went on for years to the point where we started actually doing it. After starting the work, signing the contract, this is the condition of what we were given. Yeah, that was a biryani hotel on the road. 
50 years of dumping building rubble. We had to move it. June 2008. By December, we created that water body again from the St. Tom Causeway up to the past Carpegan Bridge up to RK Mutt Road. Gradually, we planted 200,000 plants of 187 indigenous species, all closely monitored by the best botanists in Tamil Nadu, making sure we're doing the right thing. And it's become something else. And of course, the process has started again. Things give birth and a fisher, a fisher bird and you bring in beauty and simple design. And this is the Ponga now, it's a place in the middle of that city of 11 million people. And we've tried to create something where people can um, remember where they came from, because we all came from wilder places. The fiddler crabs come back to the estuary, the pelicans, of course. And there, it's nice when the bottom the bottom left hand corner when when things start eating other things and you know that you've got processes right. using natural materials bringing technologies of water treatment low forms and, yes, and lots of art lots of little bits of carving and painting and people in the end become Sidosham. So, yeah, this is the Ponga in different light, in different incarnations. But uh, our environment center. Remember, that's what it looked like. That's what it looked like now, what, 12 years ago. Yeah, and we turned it into that. It looked like that. That's kind of I'm having you into that. I think the word is transformation. You've got to change things. Find something that's a mess and make something beautiful out of it. That's my deep plea. And there's plenty to do. There's Srinivas Purim. Look at the garbage on the edge. Now that, this is recent. This is last year. This is part of our team. Perhaps some of these are watching today. Part of our team that are making a floating island actually f create an island pretty high technology but simple also and it can be a bamboo and then plant plants this is actually creating yeah we've got one anchored off the boat club that's got solar panels that run a pump and it's quite a complex one now. but this is a very interesting technology which we hope more and more to bring to the waterway Imagine the Buckingham Canal. You don't have to imagine it. You can go and look at it. That's what it looks like now. Look like that. The Buckingham Canal could have a series of floating islands with, with, with real and artificial root systems going down, creating a habitat for all sorts of cleaning microorganisms. And as I said, let's work towards the day where we can step along a sweet-smelling Buckingham Canal to go for a swim in the Antarctica. This is part of the education program that the team in Chennai has been working on for the last decades. We started this 15 years ago. It was very active. And we've started again recently. And we're moving out into other schools. And perhaps we're going to be involved with even some of you people too with our humble experience of, say, fun, experiential learning, all sorts of um, ways, definitely, as you can see, not in a classroom. And lots of, lots of, of teaching of rare phenomena, which I cannot find in the curriculum, or I cannot find any department in any of your institutions called Department of Common Sense. You remember a few years ago? A lot of water, a lot of people, a lot of people drowned, a lot of damage. And then the people who 
yeah, have all these big industries and companies. In this case, it was TCS approached and said, look, could you help work on the lakes again? It's back to the lake story. We made a plan. We dug. This is only last year. And we created that. If you go out to Sirius 3, that's sort of what it looked like. Now, this picture was actually only taken last week. So there's water there, all the plants we planted. And we hope to plant another 10,000 this year, perhaps with your help. We created these hills. And these are the forests that are going to be into the future. Actually, thousands of acres of indigenous forest that could be replanted, restored all the way through to Vandalur. The birds of Sirius, the flora of Sirius 3. There's plenty of ideas, plenty of plans for more environment centers for which, can I ask just quietly, we need your help. So, just the last few slides are of this little sanctuary. We call it the sanctuary here in Pichandigot, where I'm sitting now. And this is one of our meeting spaces. And you're most welcome. There again is the miracle plant. And the forest is full of miracles. It's nothing you can get on Amazon. So, I think that's what it's about. We don't inherit the land of our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. The great writers and the Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now it's time for the question and answer session. Uh, if you have any questions to ask Joss, uh, please uh, do uh, type it in either on the YouTube or um, directly on the Gmeet if you're on Gmeet. He that plants trees loves others, loves others besides himself. Thank you, sir, for boosting our love for nature and making us realize again that forests are the lungs of our land, purifying the air and giving fresh strength to our people. Thank you so much. Girls, we have the question answer session now. Please share the questions posed to our resource person. Bhavya, Miss Bhavya Narmada, do we have any questions in the YouTube chat box? Still now there are no questions, ma'am. Thank you so much. Girls, we have the question answer session now. Please share the questions. Kindly check again. Checking, ma'am. I'm checking. There is no button still now, ma'am. I posted also saying like students can post a question there. Aksa is asking, Joss, was there a certain order of plants when you started the restoration? Yes. As I mentioned, it's this. It's this uh, word common sense. We had, we had looked at environments, we looked at the matrix that was there in the remnant forests. We looked particularly at the, perhaps the edges of the remnant forests, where the remnant forests were trying to come back again. And as much as possible, we, uh, yeah, we, we, we copied the matrix, the, the mixed plants that was there. In some cases, because it is an evergreen forest, we need to have host plants. Sometimes we planted 
faster growing species, ones that would give some shade. Or perhaps we just use dead leaves or hamara leaves just to create a habitat so these poor young seedlings could, grow, could grow up in the full sun. But it's mostly common sense, it's observation. All you can teach people is to open their eyes. All you can teach is that people that start to see, start to see. And so we don't have time anymore. We're running from this place to another. We don't have time to get down onto our knees and look closely at the soil. We don't have time to think about, you know, what's growing underneath the ground. And of course, we don't look up so much. So, Another yeah. question uh, from Mary Madhimai. Kindly tell about infinity resources, natural resources of India. I don't understand the infinity resources. Infinity resources, natural resources of India. Um, Mary, can you elaborate your question? It's not very clear what you're asking for. Yes, Bhavya. Bhavya, please help the resource person. What is the question actually? It is about uh, the infinity resources. Mm -hmm. We are asking to yes. tell about infinite resources and uh, natural resources of India. I to have plants inside the room. Right. I, I, I'm not sure whether this is the answer. You're asking about the, the natural resources of India. I mean, India is one of the repositories of such extraordinary natural resources. Yeah. And the Western Ghats, the Himalayas, it's got so many habitats. It's the it's one of the gardens of the world. And this, the Coromandel Coast, the Cowrie Delta, this area of the world, is just it is a garden. And that's why, when when I say remembering the future garden, we can bring back this garden. You can have as many technological parks or cities as you like, but if we don't bring back the garden, um, it's it's a waste of time. And we can bring back gardens into cities and into technological parks. We're just being asked to help bring a garden into the middle of Sipcot in southern Chennai. So bring back the garden, the climate, the sea, everything is there. The biodiversity is one of the highest on the planet in this wonderful country of India. Sure. Yeah, if it's you choose the right plant, so the plant isn't suffering. But uh, you know, in this climate, keep the air conditioned off. Turn the air conditioned off. For good. <laughs> Create habitat around you so that there's just cool air flowing in. Air conditioning is not very healthy. And plants don't like air conditioning, I'm sure. The soil does it have a memory of how fertile it was or something like that? I'm sure. How do you bring it back to a state or, or will it ever get, so supposing a soil had the capacity to be very fertile, maybe 100%, will it ever come back to a state of that 100% fertility and how long will it take, for how, how long, how big is that process, how long is that process of bringing back the soil's memory of its fertility and its microflora? Yeah, interesting questions. The whole thing is memory. I mean, water has memory. Water is one of the, the most important carriers of memory. But everything has memory. Everything's trying to remember, you know, a time when it was, it was a lot, um, it was a lot more in balance. 
And but I do question. It's like how long, how many, whatever. It's all this quantitative stuff. Just start the journey. Just start the journey. That's all that is needed. We had no idea. Fifty years ago, remember those pictures? We're in the middle of this funny desert, and we didn't. I don't. I don't ever remember questioning and saying, "Well, is it?、Uh, are you going to bring back the forest? Is, is the forest going to be there?" What mother said, because we said, "Look, what do we do?" We did our degrees in philosophy or languages or this or that or law. We don't know anything about plants. And she said, "Go out in those empty fields and see if you can see." The only tool we have is our imagination. It is all there, whether you call it heaven, whether you call it Brindavan, whether you call it whatever. It's all there in the subtle physical, just waiting to come down, if you just help it. The planet, for a long time, thousands of years. Has been used, abused, raped. It's bad news for the planet, and nature is just waiting for some helpers. And this is the point, and it's mostly to do with with multinationals from the Roman Empire to the Greek Empire to every other damn empire. Sorry, we're getting into the politics there, but as soon as you start to into that, away from the The people who tend the land, who love the land, who know that that looking after the soil is their future. As soon as that's taken away by some collective process or multinational cropping patterns or whatever, whatever, please, then it starts to go downhill. And Indian soils have been very, very damaged lately, just like soils all over the world. Too many chemicals.、Right. You know the story. So just start that process. But as soon as you start, then all the energies and the the spirits of nature will help you in all sorts of ways. And this doesn't mean we have to go back to being caveman or whatever. Come on. This we can have the highest, best of technology. Yeah, and. And a whole new, wonderful garden to live in. Please, all of you, try and find the film 2040. 2040. Damon Gamal, young Australian filmmaker. I think you could probably find it. It's very positive. 2040. If you don't, if you can't find it, write to us, and we'll make sure you get it. 2040, and it's it's full of hope, and that's what you need in this really strange, dark time of Corona and post-Corona. Just trust there's going to be hope, but start doing the right thing. So many people are doing the wrong thing, unnecessary things. <laughs> Are there any more questions?、Uh, no, ma'am. There are no questions. Thank you, sir, for being so responsive to our participants. The smallest kind of action is worth more than the grandest intention. A true leader has the confidence to stand alone. The courage to make tough decisions, and the compassion to listen to the needs of others. Here is such a wonderful leader who has proved that leadership is a privilege to better the lives of others. I now humbly request Dr. Joseph Catherine, Principal Stella Matijina College of Education, to propose the oath of thanks. Ma? Yes.、Uh, thank you, Mangai. A very good morning to one and all. The earth has music for those who listen, says William Shakespeare. Nature is beautiful because it is alive, moving, and mesmerizing. We are all dependent on nature for our survival as well as 
physical and psychological illness. But very often we go against nature. It is through eminent nature lovers we are reminded of nature's goodness. Today, Mr. Ross Brooks, director of Chandikulam Forest, Auroville, has ignited our minds about environment through the past and present stories and endeavors. We thank you very much, sir, for your inspiring words. Your energy has drawn us closer to nature and society, and your dedication is amazing. Thank you, sir, very much for your wonderful speech. I thank our secretary, Reverend Sister Pauline Mary, for her motivation. I extend my gratitude to all the staff of Stella Machutuna College of Education. I thank Dr. Mangai, Eco Club Coordinator, for enabling us to understand the importance of our environment. I thank also Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi, Sister Shija, and Mrs. Rubina for extending her helping hand. I thank the technical team, Ms. Aniruddha, Bhavya, Ganeshri, and Kristen for their support. Let us save nature for the future. Once again, I thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for your graceful and gratifying words. I express my sincere gratitude to the patron of this webinar, Reverend Sister Paul and Mary, Secretary of Stella Matutino College of Education, for giving us this wonderful opportunity to organize this international webinar. I also thank the Pichandikulam Forest team, especially Ms. Jayasuga, the Program Manager of Environmental Education of Pichandikulam Forest and Ms. Lakshmi Venugopal, Senior Manager of Environmental Education, Pichandikulam Forest, for their cooperation and kind support. Thank you, Sudha ma'am and Lakshmi ma'am. I also thank our resource person, Mr. Joe Brooks, for his contribution for educating our students about nature and is insisting on the responsibility to maintain the balance of our ecosystem. We look forward to learn more and more from you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I thank all our dear students and colleagues of Salam Antijuna College of Education for their enthusiastic participation. Thank you all. The feedback link will be shared and you can receive your e-certificates after providing your valuable feedback with this, we come to the end of the international webinar on Remember the Future Garden, the future of the Chandikulam Forest, conducted by the Eco Club of Salam Atitina College of Education, Chennai. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, dears. <laughs>